All right, Carl Jaw is with us today. He is a well-known media commentator in the China sphere. His YouTube and X are at Carl Jaw. That's C-A-R-L-Z-H-A, or for you, if you're an American like me, at C-A-R-L-Z-H-A. He is the host of Silk and Steel podcast, a regular guest on RT, CGTN, and other media platforms as well. Uh, it's great to talk with you today, man. Always good to see you oh. again, Jason. So I guess the big thing is there was just an earthquake in uh, Taiwan province. So I, actually, I only saw this after you posted something on X. So do you can you tell us a little bit about the state of things right now? Uh, it's actually a pretty big one. It's a 7.4. Some report is 7.5 magnitude, uh, but looks like the center of the quake is happened on relatively sparsely populated east coast of Taiwan. So rather than the more densely populated west coast of Taiwan facing mainland China, uh, but still there's, uh, I saw videos of, you know, like buildings collapsing. Um, it, it looks like it's a, a, a pretty serious. I mean, like I heard um, Andy Borhan reporting from Shanghai that he felt the sh aftershock all the way in Shanghai. Uh, we didn't feel anything in Bali, but we're sufficiently far away from Taiwan. Yeah, in Beijing, I don't think we feel a thing. I was actually in the CCTV tower recently, and I was thinking, I don't think this thing's built for an earthquake, but I don't think there are earthquakes in Beijing. You know, this bizarrely shaped building that that hangs out over this over the other buildings. And I'm like standing looking through the little holes on the bottom and I'm look, looking down at the ground and I'm thinking, I am glad earthquakes don't happen here in Beijing. Anyways, I want to switch to economics, uh, which is really why I have you on the show. You're really good at global economics. So in your assessment right now, uh, well, this isn't just economics, but the U.S. global dominance seems to be receding. There was a, a, re a report that came out yesterday or the day before the show that people in Southeast Asia are largely saying they would choose China. And that is different from a couple of years ago. So, you know, you're in Southeast Asia. Why do you think that is? Well, I think uh, for, for one thing, the gravitational pull of the Chinese economy is very felt, felt very strongly here. Uh, for example, here I'm talking with you on the internet uh, uh, that was built by Huawei. Huawei built the 4G network here in Indonesia. The electricity that this, that powers this conversation is provided by Chinese-built power plants north of Bali, um, and uh, you know I can go on the, the, the my my phone uh, my Xiaomi phone <laughs> which we are recording uh, this conversation on. You know, Chinese-made smartphone made basically made smartphone affordable to a lot of people in the global south, including Indonesia. Uh, like our nanny has a smartphone. She has a Vivo, I think. And so, so this is, uh, whereas, you know, if you just compare simply the, the level of investment, the U.S. versus China in Southeast Asia, the, the Chinese investment in South Asia absolutely dwarfs, dwarfs the U.S. investment into the region. Um, the, the one of the other big projects that China completely re completed recently in Indonesia is the Jakarta Bandung high speed railway. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you're from California, yes, Jason? Yeah. And yeah, yeah so we we know the story with the California high speed rail, which mm -hmm. <laughs> we start planning in the early 2000s. No, and, I heard and, about it. This is interesting to me. I heard about it in the 1990s. I had to write a high school report on it in my like senior year. There's like, oh, f find some project and write a report on it. So I found that I was like, wow, this is really cool. And I presented to everyone like it was going to be there in a few years. And then I posted that on X and someone said when their father was doing radio in the 1960s, they were already talking about it. So here it is like 60 years later and you know, it's barely even started. But I mean, in that same time, and from 2008 to now, what is it, 45,000 uh, kilometers of high-speed rail? And that's just in China. And you're, as you're pointing out, China is clearly building in Southeast Asia and other places as well. Yeah, I mean, this is so, so you know, you, like the choice is quite clear. You, 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 you trade with China, you benefit from uh, being integrated with, uh, with a trade network with China. Whereas 
U.S. presence in Southeast Asia now is primarily military. I mean, the pivot to Asia that started with Obama administration, they're not talking about pivot economically. They're not pivoting investment into Southeast Asia. They're pivoting military deployment and, and U.S. bases. So this is quite a sharp contrast from hmm. um, oh, the U.S. and Chi Chinese approach to Southeast Asia. Another thing that bears to mention is uh, you know, where I am in Indonesia, it's a majority Muslim country. Uh, and, and so is uh, Malaysia next door. And, you know, what U.S. is doing supporting Israel in the Middle East is not popular. It's not popular, to say the least, hmm. in this part of the world. Right. So, yeah, I mean, if I if I were a leader in a nation, I would want trade, economic development. You know, ultimately, even in the United States, they always say it's the economy dummy. And they're talking about, you know, whether an elected leader is going to be able to maintain their place. So if you're an elected leader in Southeast Asia, you're thinking the same thing. I need to grow my economy. What is going to grow my economy? More trade. And that is what China offers. Like you said in our previous interview, China is open for business. You know, I get a lot of people who say, Oh, what, you know, if I was the leader of such and such country, I would just trade with China, not the United States. Or if I was the leader of China, I would not trade with the United States. And I think that's actually not China's strategy at all. China is going to trade with anyone, everyone, every, anyone who wants to buy and sell and trade goods. China is like, OK, we're here. So, I mean, I think that is one of the advantages of doing trade with China is that it is stable, that the relationship of continuing trade is a stable relationship. But I have, I have, some, I have other questions, lots of other questions. So in your opinion, do other Americans largely uh, seem to understand what is taking place? Because outside of the United States, it seems pretty clear. But in your assessment, I mean, we're both abroad, but you, you were back recently. Do you think other US Americans are like, oh, this is not going so well or they're like yay good times well i mean let's let's be real here Mo most of americans can't even find southeast asia on a map <laughs> so and most of them are just being led uh by the nose by the mainstream media reporting uh in in in, in u.s and what the mainstream media reporting is china is being aggressive to its neighbors the U.S. have to commit its territory to guarantee a free and open Indo-Pacific, right? I mean, that's the that's the mainstream media right now. Um, but the, the the reality, of course, is different on the ground. I'm going to add um, also the, the 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 Chinese investment in the region is also uh, a, a different in a different way from say for for example U.S. investment because there are, there are U.S. investment in Indonesia but they're mostly focused in the mining sector like mm. uh, Fremont uh, they're they're focused on uh, mining in West Papua and or uh, oil and gas exploration uh, offshore uh, but China is uh, is doing is investing in all arenas. And they're not just interested in uh, natural resource extraction. They, China is helping to build a nickel factory in Indonesia. So they're, the, Indonesia is one of the major nickel producing uh, region in the world. So the Indonesian nickel no longer needs to be loaded on ships a raw commodity to be processed in other parts of the world. Now, Indonesia can process their own nickel uh, themselves, which provided the added value. Um, so this is something that, that China is help, uh, uh, help with the region that U U.S. firms are not. You know, that's a really interesting point, because I've read that in a few books about how IMF and World Bank failed to develop the underdeveloped world and how this is just replicating models of colonialism. And one of the things that, uh, you know, for people who haven't studied uh, colonialism, one of the things the Europeans and the Americans did is they went in and then they would extract, you know, resources from those countries, bring them back to their own country where they had factories, develop them into finished goods and then ship them back and sell them to those people for considerable value but you know the uh, kind of infrastructure that china is building around the world not just in indonesia but in other places is allowing local factory growth and a lot of the energy projects that china is doing in africa and in southeast asia uh laos vietnam is allowing factory growth to begin to really develop and to flourish in 2000 the year 2000 laos had 40 percent electrification by 2020, it had 100% electrification. That doesn't just allow people to have refrigerator 
and TVs, but it also allows them to open factories and to process using local, uh, you know, uh, va- you know, uh, resources to make finished goods and export those for, as you just pointed out, added value. Um, you know, Gina Rom- Romando, the uh, spokesperson for Huawei, she recently said, sorry, sorry, the <laughs> Commerce Secretary for the U.S., she recently said the U.S. will, quote, do anything to ensure China can't catch up or compete with the U.S. in advanced technology. In your assessment, is that working? How can you keep one-fifth of humanity done? You know, one in every five person in the world lives in China. And what they're saying is, no, we, we will not allow you to progress technologically. Um, you know, you want to roll back of your, your progress. This is really foolhardy. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, China is not, um, you know, China, China is focused on its own internal growth. They're not doing this to compete with Americans. They're doing this to make the life better for average Chinese citizens. Uh, it, it's the U.S. that's forcing countries in the world to choose. Uh, most of the countries in the region, particularly Southeast Asia, they don't want to have to have to choose between China and United States. They're perfectly fine to trade with both because you know the the idea is you can never have too many friends, and you don't want to make any enemies. You know, to be friends of all and to be enemy of none, and that's a very sensible policy. But but U.S. got this bug. This is bug of uh, of, of, of you know have to maintain the U.S. supremacy over the world at at no matter the cost. That's forcing people to choose. You know, you're either with me or against me. It's my way or the highway. And you know that doesn't play well in today's world. We're now no longer live in the the post Cold War. You know the. Uh, U.S. hyperpower unipolar moment anymore. We live in a multipolar world. People have more choice. You know, one of the things with rise of China is giving people choices, giving people alternatives, so they don't always have to rely on IMF and World Bank loans. Now there is China offering loans, uh, so people can pick and choose. And uh, you know, what U.S. wants to do is taking that option away for people. I mean, that that's. It, it's the the choice is quite simple. You know, this is why many people would rather side with China in this approach. You know, they're they're not necessarily siding with China. They're siding with their own, you know, own best interest. And uh, and sorry, what was it? Did you answer your question? Well, I was ask I, a follow up question. I think that would help yeah, clarify. Yeah, okay. In terms of Chinese technological advancements, do you think? that China is still behind the curve of the United States. And a lot of people accuse China of copying U.S. technologies. Or is China, how would you describe China's relationship to advanced technology right now? Oh, right, right. Okay, so let's actually go back to your question about Gina Raimondo. Hmm. The, the, the chip sanction the, was specifically targeting Huawei by the broad range of Chinese tech sector. That was to... Uh, we saw Huawei make their chip breakthrough just recently. Uh, you know, it th- th- was quite a shock to many U.S. decision makers that China is now able to manufacture seven nanometer chips. They mm. thought, okay, you know, you, you, China will be lucky if they get to 14 nanometers, and, and no way they're going to make it to seven nanometers because U.S. has already taken all the tool sets away. And to everyone's surprise. China, China is developing their own method, their own tool sets. And, and the, the Gina Raimondo approach is, you know, just because our sanction is working is because our sanction is not broad enough. So we're going to expand right, the sanctions. Right. I mean, this is basically, uh, this reminds me what uh, Joe Biden said about the U.S. bombing campaign in Yemen. And, and, he, and he said, well, is it U.S. bombing? Um, is the U.S. bombing helping to break the blockade of Red Sea? No. Are we going to stop doing it? No. I mean, basically, that's U.S. approach right now. The sanction is not working, but they're going to do it anyway and they further expand sanctions. Sanction is, is counterproductive because uh, prior to the U.S. tech sanction on China, China actually was dependent um, mm. Chip import is China spend uh, average about four hundred billion U.S. dollars on chip imports, which means China has spent more on chip import than they spend 
on importing oil. And that dependency was growing year after year as the Chinese economy itself was growing. So in fact, you know, China's dependency on the U.S. tech sector was, was growing. And, and yet U.S., uh, the, the bright genius from the U.S. Commerce Department and, you know, all the Pentagon and all the Washington uh, uh, big heads, they thought, oh, ha, we, th we saw this uh, weakest link. Well, you know, well, you know what? We're going to snip this part of the supply chain. We're going to force Chinese back to the Stone Ages. But what has happened instead is it, it, it pointed out for, for China, you know, what their, you know, vul vulnerability is in their supply chain. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, even though people, people have pointed out, oh, but Chinese government has spent decades, decades trying to foster its own indigenous semiconductor industry, but it hasn't, has always lagged behind the West, you know, uh, many generations behind. So how, how would their latest effort, you know, be any different? But the difference is the U.S. sanction. You know, before the U.S. sanction, firms like Huawei, they can easily go purchase Qualcomm chips. They can, they can, uh, or they can go to uh, TSMC on Taiwan to manufacture their own chips. But, but there's no reason, in other words, the, the Chinese commercial firms, they have no reason to work with uh, the, the domestic Chinese chip manufacturers, especially when the domestic chi uh, Chinese manufacturers are usually uh, three, four, or five generations behind their Western counterparts. Because the commercial, the private Chinese companies, their goal is to rush out a good product the Chinese consumer would buy. You know, they don't care if the components will come from US, from Japan, from Korea, from, from Netherlands. They just want to get the best of its class, put it into their product, and then uh, so to sell their product at a quality and a price that the consumer would, would, would purchase. But now the US sanction is to tell all the uh, Chinese tech companies like, it's, it's basically hanging a sword on the top of all Chinese tech companies uh, that, that, you know what, we can cut you off at any time of this very vital part of your supply chain and force your companies to 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 close. I mean, for a while, Huawei's uh, phone business, handset business almost got wiped out because of the chip sanctions. You know, for, when I first came to in, in Bali, for example, you will see Huawei everywhere in store. But for a couple of years after the sanction, like the old Huawei phone just disappeared. There's still other Chinese brands who are not under sanction, like Vivo, Oppo, and Xiaomi. But the Huawei phone was gone. And inside China, Apple basically cannibalized all the Huawei market share. And but that is a is a huge alarm bell to all other Chinese tech company. Like we can be the next Huawei if we grew to the point that uh will catch the attention of the US State Department. And 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 also for Huawei, they have no choice. They have to go the domestic route. Now they have to work with SMIC, the domestic uh Chinese producer of semiconductors. So so now it it kind of for the first time the Chinese private industry and the Chinese government uh, objective are perfectly in a line. This was forced upon by the U.S. sanctions. And, and now what we saw is that, that because it's such an existential issue for the Chinese tech industry, it's a do or die uh, situation. And, and this, kind of, this is a kind of the situation that fosters innovation. And, and SMIC was able to pull it off by making the seven nanometer chip for Huawei um, under under heavy sanctions. Of course, you know, uh, obviously, sanction is not working. Huawei has roared back with their new phone, and they took back all their market share from Apple in China. Uh, but you know, Gina Raimondo method is, you know what? Okay, we, maybe there's a loophole in our sanctions. We got tighten it even more and expand more sanctions against uh, any suppliers to Huawei. Um, again, this is just gonna uh, uh, force China to work uh, uh, tighter, more tightly together with each other, uh, making everybody to work faster, harder. Uh, you know, try to graduate 
uh, China graduated 1.7 million engineers in 2023. Mm. Uh, you know, what, versus I think it was like 500,000 in U.S. So there's no competition. I mean, like China, in terms of tech nowadays, um, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing you cannot solve by throwing a bunch of people and shit tons of money. I mean, and, and give it time, things will happen. I mean, that's what China is doing right now. China has already ramped up the domestic uh, semiconductor manufacturing, um, especially in the low low and mid end. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What people don't, you know, people right now is focused on TSMC, the Taiwan semiconductors, which manufacture most of the world's advanced chip. But the vast majority of the chip market is still in the low to mid end chips. That because now that we use chips in everything, in, in refrigerators, in in cars, and 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 now China is able to manufacture everything from low to medium range of the chips, up to all the way to seven nanometer. Um, the effect of the the U.S. sanction is such that that if Chinese company have a choice. They, now they will go domestic because mm -hmm. you know they, they gotta get, have a have a guarantee that they won't be cut off. So what that means is this four hundred billion dollar chip market. China mm -hmm. is, is the world's largest market consumer. For yeah, yeah. So that means all this market that's uh, if, as, as yeah, Germany, as Sweden, China, Japan, United States, uh, Taiwan province, all cut off from the largest importer of chips in the world by their own choice. Yeah. And so now China yeah. will be completely self-reliant in the future. In five years, all of these companies will have redundant manufacturing because China because China is the largest exporter of electronic devices. Like you mentioned, coffee machines and televisions and all these things that use these chips. And if they don't need to import them anymore, which is the United States is forcing them not to, it's just ridiculous. It's really, it really frustrates me that, you know, the United States, in addition to the fact that the United States is ultimately hurting itself and its allies long term, another thing that really frustrates me is that the United States is throwing away goodwill. You know, the deeper we have economic relations with China, the better our, you know, the whole world is going to be moving forward. This is the most important economic and, and political relationship in the world. And if we can have good relations, that's good for global peace. That's good for everyone. And so the United States is constantly like, what can we do to try to, you know, screw over China? But then China is just like, okay, we'll just do that ourselves then. Like, it's just, it really is just bizarre watching like Gina Raimondo and that kind of thinking, you know, why are these people given a bit the ability to do these things? Doesn't she have people around her warning her of the co potential consequences? Because it seems pretty obvious to a lot of people. That's the thing. That's a, I think there's a cutoff between the the people who stuck in the beltway bubble and the people who were actually work in the industry. Because right now, a lot of the Chinese tech companies are telling Washington, "Stop doing this." You're killing our future business. I mean, uh, even even like the the the, the tech firm that's on the top of the world right now, like Nvidia. You know, Nvidia, their biggest market is in China, and yes. and U.S. is telling Nvidia, no, you have to cut off your top AI chips to China. And and it's there. All these uh, U.S. tech companies are saying, you are killing us. What the hell? You don't know what you're doing. You're and and. Like I said, this, this China is the world's largest market for for uh, semiconductors. Once China achieves self sufficiency, you know, once these uh, uh, the consumers of chips goes Chinese, they're not never coming back. They're not coming back to to the to 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 source their components from U.S. companies ever again because for just for the fear that might they might get cut right. off. And, yeah. and as you mentioned, you know, uh, Chinese. Like a lot of the high tech Chinese firm, like uh, Huawei, for example, the CEO, founder and CEO of Huawei, the, uh, Zhenfei, he was a big lover of the United States. He was a big admirer of the United States. You know, same goes for the the founder of ByteDance, the parent company of TikTok, and and by by U.S. government is forcing them to to do with the reality with the sanctions, like. Oh yeah, you, you love us, but guess what? We have to screw you because we want to be number one. <laughs> and and this is this is completely misguided because 
China, there's no reason China and U.S. cannot coexist and prosper together. Um, but again, it's it's a it's a kind of the uh, the mentality of Washington elite that somehow U.S. have to be number one no matter what. Uh, you know, like they they, they want to you know even roll back the progress for one fifth of humanity and 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 the 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 fact it's it's a it's a self defeating policy and it not just hurts Chinese but it hurts American as well mm -hmm. it, yeah it hurts a few it hurts a it hurts the bottom line of the of the American companies that's that's selling to China you know many ways you know PM sells more cars to China than they sell in United States. And the U.S. the effect of the U.S. sanction is that GM factories in China producing cars for the Chinese market they cannot buy semiconductors from China to make cars they sell in China because of U.S. sanctions. This is completely ridiculous. Hmm. Well, you know, I kind of wanted to go a little deeper into that. And one of the things that I've been noticing, I think this is becoming a trend for people to really point out, is, yeah, the United States has historically, the last few decades from the 60s and 70s, had the largest consumer base in the world, the largest amount of people buying things. And so a lot of people were like, we need to access the American market because they have lots of people who are willing to buy our products. So if you're a business person in Europe, you're a business person in Asia, it doesn't matter. You want to get into the American market. And so that has been one of the the reasons the U.S. economy has been so strong for so long. But now it looks like if you look at the statistics, you have 135 million middle class Americans, but you have four or 500 million, you know, middle class Chinese consumers. And that's growing, you know, as the GDP of China increases, disposable income by purchasing power parity or however you want to measure it is also increasing. So is the in your assessment, you know, down the line in five or 10 years, like, or even, you know, next year, do you think that the United States and the companies in the United States may end up regretting try damaging Sino-US relations because ultimately China's going to have a consumer economy that's three or four times larger than that in the United States? Well, I mean, US companies are regretting right now. This is not their policy. They don't want to continue to do business with China. It's just uh, big heads in Washington that decide to impose the sanctions. Uh, most of the US companies are against it. And, and you know, the, 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 the only ones who are not affected are the US companies that do not have a business presence in China, where I'm, I'm talking about Facebook and Google. <laughs> and and they, they're, they those companies are also online trying to kill off TikTok in US right now because TikTok is their major competitor. <laughs> and uh, so so this, you know, we have, uh, it's, it's uh, it's it's crazy what, what what U.S. government is trying to do. They're basically essentially trying to build a wall um, around U.S. and and also its ally, so-called ally, but really vassal states in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're trying to try to divide the world into two blocks again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically they're bringing back the Cold War. And I think they're in their mind, uh, their thinking is, okay, we know how Cold War one title played out. You know, you have the Soviet bloc and then you have the, the Western bloc and we won. We won Cold War one title. So we can do it again. But uh, the time is different. I mean, China is the manufacturing uh, is a manufacturing center of the world. It's China is a factory of the world. You, when you're trying to cut off China, you're not just, uh, you're, you're, what you're really doing is you're, you're cutting yourself off from the world uh, because China will continue to make goods not only for, for, for people in China, but all over uh, global South countries and, and all over the emerging economies. So, you know, so we're already seeing the effect of that, you know, you know, we can look at the uh, areas, for example, when when uh, when U.S. applies sanction against Huawei, um, you know, U.S. is still struggling with five G, and, and 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 China is already moved moving ready to move on with six G, and so this is this, so we're gonna what most more more likely and and also China is uh, is rolling out. Um, with uh, uh, you know their their sustainable energy uh, and also oh, with yeah. By and, the way, in terms yeah. of five G, this is a five point five G portable hotspot that I could get from Huawei. 
So I already have 5.5 in China. I mean, yeah. this thing works like if I go to the Himalayas, it'll just up you standing on the mountain. I've got 5.5 G. In the United States, they still have like 3G, 4G levels in some of the remote parts of the country. That is not the case here. Yep. Yep. But yeah, in terms of the solar and, and wind it's, and, and uh, you know, all the green energy, it is so shocking how fast it's going. I mean, I, I have been a proponent of China's move towards green energy for many years, but I was surprised by 2023. It was shocking how much they actually rolled out. And a lot of people are like, oh, it's inter intermittent. But China has so many new tools, just amazing, like new technologies, like gravity uh, storage, like where they have just move boulders up and down in these huge towers and water up and down streams and all kinds of stuff to maintain uh, electrification all the time. In addition to the fact that there's still a mix of fossil fuels in, in with everything and nuclear is going. I mean, China's but China's economy, one of the main drivers of 2023, was rolling out all of these renewable energies. And China's technology is clearly, you know, really advanced. China now has the highest high speed, the fastest high speed rail line in the world. And maglev is actually becoming a reality very soon, according to some uh, friends of mine. So it's just it's just amazing to see that the United States is like, oh, we'll just cut China off from this technology. What are you talking about? The United States is like a museum of 20th century artifacts. I mean, China, in many ways, China has already outpaced the United States in most important technologies. Yes, there are some, you know, critical technologies the United States is ahead in. But if the United States just cuts China off, China will just make those anyways. So it's really bizarre to see this kind of strategy instead of, hey, China's the next big thing. Let's be buddies with them. That would, in my opinion, as an American, that makes a lot more sense. I mean, that's what the UK did. They were like, oh, wow, the United States is the next big thing. We're buddies, you know, you and me. And like, that's what the United States should be doing with China, in my assessment. Well, I think one of the problems is uh, uh, nowadays very few Americans who travel to China. Um, you know, very few Americans speak Chinese. Very few Americans has, you know, ever set foot on China. And so their idea of China is not actually the country itself. Their idea of China is existing a bizarre world that's constructed by their media. And, and, and the, the point is that the, the, I, I have a feeling the elite in the Beltway, they start to imbibe in their own propaganda. Mm -hmm. <laughs> their, their idea of the world is totally warped and they don't, they don't they probably don't even realize uh you know how far ahead China is at this point. They still think you know Washington can push its weight around. Well I wanted to ask you what are your opinions about de-dollarization? I I love to ask people, especially like people like you who know about this, like is there going to be an inflection point and what are the potential consequences for the dollar if the u.s keeps increasing debt levels at the speed that it is now and countries you know even mo slowly migrate to other currencies well i mean people have been talking about the dollarization for for decades but the real big inflection point i think was the the sanction the russian sanction because mm. prior to that um uh, you know, like people, everybody knows there's a need to move away from the dollar, but it's just so convenient because it's accepted everywhere. Hello, that's my son just came in. I have to say hello. Uh, Hi. Okay. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, Papa working okay. <laughs> and and uh, so it, uh, oh, come on, go, go. <laughs> I lost my train does of that thought. Time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I lost my train of thought. We're talking about de-dollarization. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, for you know, people have realized the importance to move you know, away from dollar for a long time. But just but the dollar is so convenient because every you can use it everywhere. Everybody accept it. Um, there's not. You know the 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 pro overweighs the cons. Um, however, yeah. with a very drastic Russian sanction, that's that's what make that what's made people set up and take notice. Like holy crap! You know, not only you can cut off a country off completely, but you actually can take their money. You know, they with a frozen Russian asset. And now Yellen now wants to give that to other countries. Yes, yes, that's robbery. That's right. I mean, that they did that with Afghanistan too, by the way. Yeah, and, it was it was nine billion, I think. 
Yeah, and and this is this is quite obscene. You know, Afghanistan, one of the poorest country in the world, uh, and you're taking you are taking their money away. So this is this for Russia again. They had no choice. They had to move off the dollar platform because that's a U.S. Pol U.S. government policy. So again, you know, this U.S. policy. I mean, a lot of the 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 diplomatic setbacks that the U.S. is facing right now is mostly self-inflicted. Um, like the, the U.S. government policy literally pushed forward the momentum for de-dollarization, and and this is when a uh, country of the BRICS said, "Okay, well now maybe it's time for us to talk about forming a BRICS currency," and right. and this is really important because uh, at one once upon a time, dollar, you know. U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency makes sense because after World War II, U.S. is one of the few countries that was not devastated. Uh, in 1950, U.S. composed about 50 percent of the world GDP, and and you know U.S. was the manufacturing power of the world in a similar way that China is today. And but 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 U.S. Uh, Wall Street type have intentionally hollow out the US manufacturing manufacturing capability since the 1970s and and then US economy is now in, increasingly financialized um it, it, again that rely, itself relies on the hegemony of the dollar and and yet uh, all the US sanctions are counterproductive to maintain the dollar hegemony it, it forces people uh, to to think of alternatives, and there are plenty of alternatives because uh, you know one of the pillar of dollar hegemony is a petrodollar. I mean, you, you know, Kissinger went to Saudi Arabia back in the seventies and like, okay, let's work on the deal. U.S. will provide security in return. You got to price your uh, oil export in dollars. That basically forced everybody to 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 take dollars because you need dollars to purchase oil. Uh, nowadays. You know, Saudi Arabia's largest export market is China. Mm. Um, you know, and, and, you know, there's really not much compelling reason for Saudi Arabia, for example, for the Saudi-China trade to be conducted in dollars. They could, right. they could very easily be conducted in yuan because China makes all the manufacturing goods. China imports oil from Saudi Arabia, and, and it makes sense. Uh, you know, you can just use the Chinese RMB to buy Chinese-made goods. And this this same dynamic is happening all over the world. At the same time, the U.S. is sabotaging its own dollar hegemony by by slapping sanctions left and right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like Marco Rubio said, you know, in in other five years, we won't be able to sanction anybody anymore <laughs> because they won't be using dollars. Uh, you know, but 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 the for some reason they didn't make the connection. Is like it's the sanction itself that's forcing people off the dollars. Um, yeah, and it, it's not just Russia or or it's like half dozens of countries around the world, individuals around the world, companies around the world. The United States is slowly, like you said, creating the conditions itself for individuals and companies and countries to say, well, I guess we can't use the dollar anymore because the United States made it impossible. So, yeah, it, it, it definitely is contributing to that. And, yeah, I would say that is a really good point. That is an inflection point with what um, the United States did to Russia. I wanted to ask you about the Chinese economy because, OK, forgive me if I'm wrong, but China's economy grew by 5.2 percent last year. And the United States economy grew by 2.5 percent last year. But the United States was like, Whoa! We've got the fastest growing economy. I'm sorry. What happened? What did I miss? Is China's economy suffering? Like, what is going on here? This is like that meme, Jason. Like the guy celebrating with his big, uh, big trophy, <laughs> and then you zoom out, and he was on the bottom uh, of the ladder. That's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's the United yeah. States. Yeah, that's the United States right now. And and instead, in the mainstream media, we're ce we're celebrating the win. Of 2.5 economic growth, and you know, finally, U.S. achieved the, the the amazing growth under Bidenomics, while China is growing twice as fast. But China is supposedly collapsing. You know, the, 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 it's the end of the Chinese miracle. China, China has China is falling. And what people don't realize is that th there is a slowdown in growth in the Chinese economy. But that's a slowdown in growth. <laughs> 
economy is still growing. It's just not growing as fast as it before. And, and, and this is also because Chinese economy is going through transition. It's transitioning away from, um, from real estate uh, investment growth to, uh, to more um, uh, a growth in areas like high, high tech manufacturing. Um, it, which is actually positive in the long and mid medium term. And there'll be a, some pain in the short term because of the transition, but it's actually healthy, you know, rather than plowing all this money and resources into build uh, more houses uh, when the, the population is declining, it, it makes sense to be investing in automation, robotics, AI, et cetera. And, and China is already reaping benefits of uh, of investment into these areas, um, whereas uh, yeah yeah you 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 it's like again it's uh, like I think a lot of a lot of it is political because you know U.S. is facing uh, it's another election year and now you have all these uh, de uh, Democratic Party toadies you know including even Paul Krugman Paul Krugman is is writing articles like oh Bidenomic is working and it's making China angry and it's okay so talking about China doesn't care about Bidenomics you know she cares that, you know about the US sanctions and and uh it's it, it's uh I think it's a, a kind of uh you know that that's a where area. This is one area where U.S. is still leading the world. Copium production. I mean that that's <laughs> what we're seeing right now. We're seeing like the copium produ production off the charts. Uh, last U.S. is steadily losing its top spot um, in the world world uh, economy. And uh, yeah, it's it's uh it's 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 sad. It's sad to say because I. As as a, 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 a U.S. passport holder, a board holder, I would rather, you know, U.S. come to grip with the reality mm. and work with China, and so both countries and people in both countries can can march toward prosperity together. You know, this is what Chinese leader talk about. You know, yeah. Xi Jinping talk about the, the common destiny of the mankind. Mm. But in Washington, all they talk about is, <laughs> you know, we got to we got to crush we got to crush these uh, upstarts. You know, we got to crush Russia, China, uh, uh, Iran. And, and it's, it's, it's quite a stark contrast, you know, mm. uh, between the politicians and and but but the, the difference is in China, uh, the Chinese leadership is plan for long term. You know they have the five year plans. In United States, everything is geared towards the the short election cycle. Yeah, can I get <laughs> elected? What do I need to do right now to get elected? And that might not always even be in the best interest of the population. It's just that is what's going to get pe me make me popular for six months, just for the right window, so I can get reelected, even if it's not necessarily the best thing for the people I want, you know, and it also in terms of the belt and road, because I want to ask you about bricks in terms of the belt and road, you know, China is and has been investing in the infrastructure, in the development of these underdeveloped world that has been left out of development, not just since world war II, but during the entire colonial phase for the last several hundred years, as the Europeans and the Americans extracted all this wealth from these places. And they literally became poorer than they were. I mean, the, what what the UK did to India is just probably one of the most profound examples of that that happened all over the world. And in China too, in Africa, I mean, human beings were taken and sent to other continents as, as slaves and so forth. But the Belt and Road is going in, it's building you know, bridges, it's building ports, it's building roads, it's building hospitals, it's building uh, energy infrastructure, you know, trans uh, transition lines for electricity from all, everything that a country needs to really develop. And one of the things I've noticed is that while China is maintained, you know, the number one trading partner with most European countries and almost with the United States and actually through the United States through Mexico, China's actual trade is increasing as a percentage is in the under is in the developing world. So as a pr larger percentage of China's you know, economic growth engine that is starting to take place in the developing world, which is gigantic. And, you know, if we're talking about the United States, like clearly they're not, they don't have a long-term strategy, like you said, because they're not doing that. They're not engaging in that same way. They're just going in and saying, you have to choose us or you have to choose China. Which one are you going to choose? And then the governments are usually like, we're not making that choice. Like <laughs> we'd rather just trade with everyone. 
But like, in ter- you know, one of the things I don't understand always is BRICS. Like BRICS is obviously working on another currency and it does bring countries together. And a lot of people, when I point out oh, how much I love the Belt and Road, they're like, oh, but I love BRICS. What am I missing? What does BRICS do or what can it do to create a better multipolar world for the members and for others? Well, uh, first of all, BRICS is an eco- economic alliance. It's not a security alliance like, like NATO, right? And and uh, it, this BRICS is just a forum. I mean, originally BRICS was uh, was acronym that was coined by Goldman Sachs, right? <laughs> it was a it was a marketing gimmick, but but it actually come to fruition as the head of these countries actually sat down. You know, let's 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 talk and let's have a forum for economic cooperation. And if you look at the the the, the, the countries that's looking to join BRICS, that that list is expanding. Um, because as you you mentioned, BRICS is kind of seen as a a um, uh, as as a, as a pole that's not representing the old paradigm of the Euro American uh, economic dominance over the world. Uh, and because Br- what BRICS represents, it, it's representing the, the 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 emergence of the global South countries. Um, and you know, what one of the thing it, it's interesting uh you know if you talk about kind of the fear of the BRICS and fear of belt and road in the united states uh i remember i vividly remember an interview recent interview by tucker carlson and he's saying okay look at all these uh, uh look at our colonies in latin america china is building infrastructures why the hell is China building roads and ports and, and power plants in these places? What what is, what is their real true motive? It's like, <laughs> you know, the, that, that conversation really says a lot. I mean, because the, they, they, they really see this. So the question should really be asked, why didn't America provide the infrastructure and went in to, to build the economic engagement the way that China has done? Uh, in a way, China is stepping into a vacuum because there was need for infrastructure, there was need for economic development, but um, but these things weren't seen as profitable venues for many of the multinationals. You know, they're not interested in those things. Whereas China is investing for long term because they understand if they build the roads, build the ports, build the infrastructure, that increase the trade. Uh, and 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 with the rising uh, profile of China as uh, emergence as the um, as the, the global trading nation, that that benefits China because you know China can sell more products. <laughs> and certainly, you, yeah, you make your neighbor wealthy, then you can sell them things because they have money. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. Think, yeah, but but that's not how U.S. companies work because U.S. companies focus on the quarter early reports. <laughs> they're trying to they're trying to they're trying to make it look good for this quarter so their stocks can go up. Uh, and and again, it's it's the same short term thinking as the U.S. politicians. Um, mm. And so. Uh, so yeah, so so th- th- I think this is why a lot of the people in the global south there have high hopes for the BRICS because they're they're tired of the same old IMF and World Bank domination of their of their economy, the real the real debt traps, um, and and they're looking for alternative. Well, I have, I have a two part question. The first part is, right. are we already in a multipolar world now, or is that something that we're going to come to? Well, I will quote someone far more knowledgeable and far more qualified than I am. That's a U.S. professor, John Mearsheimer. He was asked the same question recently, and he said, yes, we're in a multipolar world right now. Um, I mean, I, I think it, that's obvious. You, you know, U.S. is waging a proxy war against Russia in Ukraine at the moment, and it's not winning, uh, you know, despite the one trillion dollar spending on the military budget, um, despite the combined might of NATO, the Russian industrial production is all producing all of them right now. I mean, it, it, again, it kind of showed the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, how the, 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 you know, when measuring 
your GDP in nominal dollars sometimes does not reflect the real strength of your economy. You know, you can have a trillion dollar military budget, but what does that really get you? Um, uh, it, it's obvious, apparently it's not getting you the 155 millimeter artillery shell that Ukraine needs because U.S. has decided to phase out artillery shell production because there was not too much profit in it. You know, they, the, the, the U.S. military industrial complex find more profit, more margins and more kickbacks in bunda high tech boondoggles like F-35. You know, there's more grease for, for all around. Uh, than, than really mundane stuff like artillery shell production. So, but yet they can't, you know, ramp it up fast enough just to feed the the war machine in in Ukraine. And 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 then you have uh, uh, what what U.S. is uh, U.S. full backing of Israel in 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 Palestine. This is cratering the U.S. soft power all Absolutely. over the globe. Right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, the United it's, States images never look so bad. I mean, I was one of those people in 2003, 2004 saying we, you know, this war in Iraq is illegal, but it didn't destroy the U.S. image abroad, even though it did for a lot of people, for millions of people, it did. But this is there's nothing like this ever in, in my lifetime in the, that has affected the U.S. image abroad as bad as the United States military support for ongoing war crimes. Yeah, I mean, you know, back in 2003, People can still make the excuse, oh, that's just George W. Bush. You know, he's one one time wacko, right? And 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 <laughs> now we're I mean this rehabilitated to our mainstream media has uh, rehabilitated George W. Bush because to just to because during the Trump presidency, you know, just because Bush wasn't, uh, uh, you know, was against Trump. So, so I mean, like now we're at Biden. There's no more excuse, and, and we are in the internet age now. Um, uh, you know, like people, it's a lot harder for Washington to control the narrative to sue just like domination of the airwave on, on, on TV. People now get their news on the internet. They can log on X. They can see in real Everyone's time. got phones and video cameras everywhere in every country, even in the underdeveloped world. So, yeah. I mean, and it's the things that are being destroyed. You know, when the United States accident, accidentally bombed a hospital in Afghanistan, you heard about that. I mean, people were like, oh, you know, it was an accident or whatever, the independent, but now it's just like constantly hospital, hospital, hospital. Okay, this is not an accident. Yeah, they, they, the, 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 the recent killing of the uh, WCK, the World's Kitchen, uh, the, uh, right. uh, yeah. the UN aid worker, you can see the videos of them providing food for for Palestinians, one moment and the next moment you saw their bodies laying out. I mean that that is a, has a huge emotional impact. And and so 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 U.S. is de very fastly depleting its prestige, its soft power. It has built up since Cold War, uh, since World War II, um, and and. and and now it's trying. I mean, I mean, this is this is. I, I think this can, this is one of the reasons why in the recent survey that shows m most of the Southeast nations would rather side with China mm -hmm. than with the United States because they can see what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in the Middle East, and they they saw that U.S. is in fact not a force for state uh, for stability. Um, in fact, U.S. is destabilizing all mm. across the world, um, and they rather just trade with China and be left alone. And and this is a, uh, you know, this is uh, you know, this is one thing that I wish you sensible U.S. decision makers, you know, mm. could take age from from China's non-interference policy. Uh, you know, yeah. U.S. has incredible resources. You know, it, it's very it's blessed. With your geographic location being being bounded by two oceans, its its homeland is incredibly secure. Uh, if U.S. just focuses on own internal development, the possibility is limited. I mean, the United States is still one of the world's richest countries. I mean, it has a lot of resources, mm -hmm. yet it decides to blow everything away in uh, in wars across the world, which makes it incredibly unpopular. So. 
yeah, I, we are we are definitely a multi world today. Multi world. <laughs> well, I mean, my next question, I think you answered my my last question for you was going to be, what better policy should the U.S. pursue than the the policies that it seems to be pursuing now? And I think what you've said is basically, you know, the United States should engage in helping develop countries around the world, develop markets around the world, stop destabilizing, destabilizing other countries, protect its, you know, develop itself. You know, I agree. I think I, I'm a U.S. citizen. I think we waste too much on uh, the military. Now, not that we don't need it. I don't. I also don't think we need to mothball our military. I think we just need to, you know, we have, what, 851 bases abroad, something like that. I'm okay with having 50 abroad, you know, like just critical locations to refuel things and stuff. Bring everyone else home. Let's rebuild our economy. Let's build some rail. Let's, you know, educate our kids better. Let's help people pay for school. Let's, you know, for people who are out of work, let's give them technical skills and, you know, do what some China has done with the, its poverty alleviation. I know that the poverty lines are different, but we could still help our poor people anyway without, you know, saying, oh, well, our poverty line's much higher. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, we have like a million homeless people. They say it's 650,000 everyone knows those numbers are are fudged and you know if we spent more of our resources developing ourselves educating ourselves and helping other developing countries you know not only would we have goodwill we would have better trade and it would be a better long-term strategy would you like to add anything to that last thoughts uh, i i agree just gave up the empire i mean the, you just yeah. give up the empire and, and develop the republic uh that's 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 would make us a much greater i mean Either either shining uh, city on the hill by example, not yeah. by trying to impose, uh, you know, your 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 uh, your your proxies into the peoples of the world. People don't like that, and 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 the, you know, yeah. I think you know, U.S. just if just cut out all the foreign interventions, that fact by itself would kind of boost the U.S. prestige by quite a bit because U.S. still have. Quite a bit of a soft powers through like Hollywood and 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 that stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Carl Jaw. You can find Carl Jaw on X and on YouTube at Carl Jaw C A R L Z H A. All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Jason. My, my pleasure.